Welcome to this special event in our fall series of the Kessler Conversations, our virtual discussions about the impact of the Richard C. Kessler Reformation Collection at Pitt's Theology Library. My name is Bo Adams, and I serve as the director of Pitt's Theology Library, and I'm joined today by the 2020-2021 cohort of Kessler Research Fellows. Please join me in welcoming Alyssa Evans, who is currently a PhD candidate at Princeton Theological Seminary, Drew Thomas, who is currently a Government of Ireland postdoctoral researcher at the School of History at University College Dublin, and Edmund Wareham, who is currently the Caldry Early Career Teaching and Research Fellow in History at St. Edmund Hall in Oxford. I'm excited to talk to our three fellows today about their research interests, their work with our Kessler Collection, and what they understand the collection's import to be for today's scholarly and faith communities. I want to start, though, by providing a bit of background about the Kessler Research Fellowship. I began the fellowship with the great support of our partners and donors as yet another way of fulfilling the core mission of the Kessler Collection, which is to maximize the impact of these rare books and manuscripts on the academy, the church, and the general public. To help academic and ecclesial communities understand the value of the figures and the debates of the 16th century, we've invited scholars to spend time with the collection, to curate its treasures for the rest of us, and to produce scholarship, not only to enrich the academic conversation about these works, but to draw attention to the collection, which is now the premier Reformation collection in North America. In 2019, we had the great privilege of welcoming the first of our Kessler Fellows, Professor Ulrich Bubenheimer of Reutlingen, Germany. Professor Bubenheimer's six-week visit to Atlanta, which produced important scholarship that is now being published, was a wonderful experience, which produced not only scholarship, but a friendship and collaborative relationship that continued to advance the work of the collection. Professor Bubenheimer continues to be engaged with our work, and he now serves on our scholarly advisory board. This year, we were fortunate to expand the program to call for three fellows, and after a rigorous review process, we have selected three accomplished scholars whose works we will all learn from, and whose connections through the Scholarly Guild will continue to drive attention to the collection and the work we do. Now, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that these fellowships are made possible by the generosity of our donors. The Kessler Collection donors not only support our robust annual acquisitions budget, which is now in its 33rd year and approaching some 4,000 items, but they also help us grow the impact of these acquisitions through exhibitions, instructional programs, and fellowships like these. And we're very interested in building upon the great success of these fellows. And to do that, we need your help. And so if you're interested in supporting the research in this collection through sponsoring a future fellow, I encourage you to get in touch with me to learn about this program. Now, with that as an introduction to the program, I want to turn to the real stars of the show who are 2020-2021 Kessler Fellows and allow them to introduce themselves. So I'll start with some general questions about research. And so Alyssa from Princeton, New Jersey, if you can tell us who you are and what kind of work you do. Hi, um, first I just wanted to say, I am so grateful to be a Kessler Fellow this year and I'm thankful for this opportunity to share. Um, yes, my name is Alyssa Evans and um, my dissertation project focuses on Andreas Karlstadt. He was an early German reformer and a colleague of Martin Luther at the University of Wittenberg. So Karlstadt is most known for the kind of public ugly break that took place between him and Luther in Wittenberg over questions over images and iconoclasm, as well as their differences over the sacraments. But my project focuses on Karlstadt pre this break, right, pre-rift, and his many contributions to the development of the reform movement in Wittenberg in its earliest years. Um, I do this by focusing on Karlstadt's writings from 1517 to 1519, and especially his commentary on one of Augustine's works called On the Spirit and the Leather. Um, one of the things that really fascinates me about this particular commentary is that it was published in four separate installments over a long period of time, um, from 1517 to 1519. And so you get a real snapshot into Karlstadt as a figure in transition. Um, you can see in detail his development away from scholasticism and towards becoming a reformer. So yes, I love that you can see him actually start putting into practice his, his new focus on the Bible and the church fathers in the commentary, as well as his attempts to kind of figure out his new methods and, and how these authorities should be read, especially in contrast to their contemporaries. So specifically as a Kessler fellow this year, um, 
I'm interested in exploring the mini Karlschat texts that the collection holds. There are over 50 of them, so that is um, very exciting. Um, and to that, this year I'll be working on a digital exhibition that draws on the collection and these texts to tell the story of Karlstadt as a reformer in Wittenberg in these early years. And I focus especially on his role in the instigation of the Leipzig debate. Um, and I actually, if it's okay, was going to go ahead and show of what will be in that collection. So this is Karlstadt's Apologeticae Conclusione in defense of the Bible and the Wittenbergers. Uh, it was printed, the, the latest date is beginning of June 1518. So this work is significant as the first public and academic defense of the Wittenberg theology faculty, as a lot of attacks were coming in in early 1518 in response to Luther's 95 Theses. So this is um, an excellent uh, work that the collection has. This is also a very rare book uh, that is an amazing resource in this collection. Um, if you can see uh, the fourth down, it says we have Contra Echium. So in his Apologetica, I conclude the young with Carl Schatt writes uh, over 100 theses specifically against Eck. And this was then reprinted in a separate edition, which is, then is taken up into this work, which was the first edition of Luther's Latin writing. So the first collection of Luther's works. Um, so this just gives kind of a small foretaste of, you know, what the exhibit will look like. That's great, Alyssa. Thank you so much. You know, we, we started this collection as focusing on Luther, and we've expanded it now and have been able to collect works from all of these figures who were so important beyond Luther and in conversation with Luther. And Karlstadt is a great example of that. So thank you for sharing. I look forward to learning a lot more about Karlstadt as we move forward. So from Princeton, let's go uh, across the Atlantic to Dublin. And Drew, can you introduce yourself to us? And likewise, kind of tell us what kind of work you do. Yes, thanks, Bo. Um, I'm Drew Thomas. I'm, at, I'm a postdoctoral government of Ireland research fellow in the School of History at University College Dublin, where I studied the German book trade at the time of Luther. Um, so many of, those, many of those Karlstadt documents, if they were published in Wittenberg, I'm very much interested in them. Um, I'm currently studying images, or rather the illustrations and the ornamentation and the decoration used in early modern books. Um, how did printers or publishers design their books? How did they market them to attract readers? Wittenberg is a very famous example because Lucas Cranach, the German Renaissance painter, was the court painter to Elector Frederick the Wise in Wittenberg. And he provided many he provided the Bible illustrations for Luther's Bible, and he provided many woodcut title page borders to decorate the title pages of these pamphlets. So I'm, I'm working on a digital humanities project, which applies machine learning and image recognition software to the illustrations in these books. So I can determine how often the illustration is used because they're used in multiple books. But more importantly, oftentimes printers don't list their names in the books. So if I can identify a reference where one illustration is used in a book without the printer and then identify it in another book with the printer, it helps in identifying the printers. And this is particularly useful in my work here with the Kessler collection, which is on counterfeits. So in 1525, one of Luther's busiest years for publishing, one in four books published in published that had a Wittenberg imprint was a counterfeit. And what I mean by that is it wasn't printed in Wittenberg. It was printed somewhere else, such as Augsburg or Nuremberg, but the printer would print Wittenberg at the bottom of the title page. Um, so in some instances, this would be to avoid censorship violations by, by hiding their involvement. They could circumvent the censorship. But in many cases, it was marketing because they knew readers wanted books from Wittenberg because they had gone under Luther's watchful eye. And the Kessler collection has about 120 pamphlets with false Wittenberg imprints that I'm very much looking um, forward to studying in depth. Thank you, Drew. As I joke with you, we don't want you to look too hard and find too many counterfeits <laughs> in our collection. But yeah. Fascinating work, and I look forward to learning more about it. So let's stay in the UK. Let's go down to Oxford and Edmund Wareham. Edmund, tell us about yourself. Thank you very much, uh, Bo, and uh, I'm delighted. I'm very excited by the opportunity to be a Kessler Fellow this year. 
And I'll be using the fellowship to develop a project uh, which I've called Making and Breaking Vows in late medieval and early modern Germany. And my interest in vows came from my previous work on convents in the region and period. And I was formerly part of a project that was uh, editing and investigating an enormous collection of 1,800 letters that survived from the Benedictine convent of Luna near Lüneburg in northern Germany from the 15th and 16th centuries. And one of the most exciting things about this letter collection is we have the first hand reaction of a group of women to the introduction of the Reformation. And in 1530, the territorial Duke of uh, Brunswick Lüneburg had sent the nuns a text which said that they had to rid the convents of popish malpractice. And this included the vows the nuns had sworn of poverty, chastity and obedience. And in opposition to this, the, the actions of the Duke, the prioress of the convent wrote to the Lüneburg Town Council and she wrote, this text that the Duke has sent us goes very much against our vows, which we avowed and swore uncoerced and with free will, which we cannot and do not want to abandon and break because our vows and oaths bind us so firmly that we cannot contemplate revoking them. So my work with the Kessler Collection is to try and understand why it was that this prioress of a Northern German convent felt so strongly about the vows she'd sworn, why she wasn't willing to break them. And also try and understand how this debate about vows wasn't just an esoteric theological issue confined to pamphlet debates, but something that was driven by the everyday actions and lives of women and men in early modern Germany. So what I'm trying to do in my project is I'm interested in why it was Protestants were determined to attack some vows, like monastic vows, but not others. Why certain Catholics defended this so robustly and what this tells us about the relation between religious practice, social relations and their dynamics. To give you just one sense, we just heard from Elissa about uh, Karlstadt and Karlstadt was one of the first um, to publicly declare his opposition to certain vows. This copy here is a, castle, a, a copy in the collection on uh, Karlstadt's 1521 work regarding vows. And he says and writes in this, regarding sacrifices and vows, our religion reminds me of, looks like that of Indians in their temples. And I'm really intrigued why, why such brilliant, why someone like Karlstadt would write such a provocative statement and what the implications of that were. That's fascinating. I mean, thank you so much for sharing. On the one hand, it's it's uh, such a different context. We don't think about vows in the same way today, and yet you're connecting it to religious practice probably has some import for us understanding how our kind of religious convictions relate to our actual practices. So um, it's great work. I'm really looking forward to hearing it. Alyssa, I want to turn back to you. You mentioned the Leipzig, Leipzig Disputation, and you mentioned some of the figures, Luther, Karlstadt, and Eck. Um, so this big conversation of 1519, can you give us a little sense of, of what was going on? What were the issues? This is what we think of as kind of the early Reformation period. What was this debate about or what were they talking about? So yes, the Leipzig debate. Um, this was an important public event. So it was a, a showdown, if you will, uh, between Luther and Karlstadt on one side and Eck on the other. Um, and I focused on it being a public event for a couple of reasons. Normally disputations were inside university events um, and disputations were seen as a way of getting at, um, getting at truth in a, in a disputed question at the time. Um, and this, this was truly public in that it was much bigger than the university and it was truly an event. So princes, rulers, bishops, students, politicians, citizens, they were all there in Leipzig. Um, yeah, it, it was really an event. And, and the two groups by the summer of 1519, um, they had already defined themselves to, uh, to a large extent. In fact, you can see the, the first collection of Luther's writings in that context um, that I showed you earlier. And the debate was really uh, an event in which these groups were coming together and you could see which directions they were moving. Um, you know, in the the Leipzig debate is known most today for the interactions that took place between Luther and Eck. Um, supposedly for the first time, Luther publicly said, 
that the people can order and who questions the divine right of the Pope as leader over all of the world's churches. Um, and then this is often characterized as kind of the leading directly to the scripture principle, but, you know, what we call Sola Scriptura. Um, however, I want to bring out that Karlstadt is the one who technically instigated this whole thing with his Apologetica Conclusionis, which we looked at earlier. Um, and he had a literary battle with Eck the entire year leading up to the debate. Um, and at the debate itself, Eck and Karlstadt uh, talk about really important theological issues um, that were central to the early Reformation. Questions about the role of the, the will and human capability and good works, you know, these kinds of technical theological debates. Um, I think that the disputation is most interesting personally in that you can see some of the diversity within the Wittenberg front. So Luther and Karl Schett both show up to Leipzig. They are a united front at this point, um, but they definitely have different theological emphases and different tactics, especially in how they're approaching the situation. Um, one of the biggest differences is that Karlstadt is not willing to um, debate over issues of the papacy at this time. Um, he wants to focus on the kind of the theological and anti-scholastic uh, issues that he's been bringing up in their literary controversy for the last year. So again, I think that's one of the, the interesting aspects of the debate is what seeing this diversity. And um, as far as Karlstadt personally, it was a very important event. You, know, you can see a noticeable change in his thinking post Leipzig. Uh, does that get at some of the? Yeah, no, that, absolutely. And I mean, I, I think it's great that you emphasize that it was a public debate. Would people have been aware of these issues, or would would a work like you showed earlier be something that would be distributed so people could kind of read up before the debate and understand what's going on? Oh, I mean, definitely people, there, there are a lot of uh, people who became famous reformers later were present um, at the debate. But, I mean, it really was uh, an event in that sense, um, you know, and, and yeah, there were a lot of people in Leipzig interested in, in what was going on and some of the questions that were, were happening there. That's fantastic. Wish we had the video cameras there that could have captured it. Um, <laughs> well, that the question does have some of the reports of the Leipzig debate. So that's, uh, you know, a plus, as well as a, a lot of Eck material. Uh, mm -hmm. um, and I think over 50, uh, you know, Eck is a really understudied figure as well. So yep. a lot in the collection to mine on that topic. Yeah, that's actually yeah, a real it. emphasis on the collection recently is to collect what we call the Catholic opponents or the other side of the conversations. Um, and it recently we issued a volume of translations of, of some of these pamphlets. So, yeah, it's very much been an emphasis to kind of fill out the picture and not simply focus on the Lutheran side of the debate. Um, Drew, let's turn to you, because I, I, I think this issue of... of counterfeits and provenance and stuff is fascinating. I think people really get into this stuff. And I know you've already done some work on one particular item in the Kessler collection, which happens to be one of these so-called counterfeits. Can you tell us a little bit about this initial success or adventure you've been on? Yeah, um, for sure. Um, but just to piggyback off of the Leipzig debate, um, just to put it into context, when Luther went to Leipzig for the debate, the residence he was staying at was the residence of Melchior Lolter, who was Leipzig's most prominent printer. And it was it was here that they they came to a relationship and Melchior ended up sending his son to Wittenberg to become a printer in Cronach's workshop. And it is his son who ends up printing the 1522 German translation of the New Testament. And it is the son's publications that are in many cases, the documents that are being reprinted in other cities with fake Wittenberg uh, imprints. So here, we have a copy of Ad Serenissimum, and this is a letter that Luther was encouraged to write to Charles V um, expressing his loyalty after publishing on the Christian nobility. Um, this is a copy in the Kessler collection. You can see at the bottom, it says Wittenberg, and then 1520 is the date of publication. If you look closely, you can see the date of publication, which is in Roman numerals, is um, has a typographical error. The M and the D has been re reversed, which is understandable as a compositor would be putting this in upside down anyway on the printing press. So you can understand how somebody might make that error. But what's nice about this copy is on the inside, there is a note 
saying that this copy was purchased from the collection of Edward Griesebach. Who is Edward Griesebach, you might ask? Here's a portrait of, of the man. He was a German diplomat and a very good book collector. And so my question while looking at the counterfeits in the Kessler collection is, when did the previous owners of these books, the collectors, did they know that these were counterfeit or did they, did they think these were original first edition books from Wittenberg? And in the case of Griesbach, in the late 1800s, he published a catalog of his library. And in this catalog, it specifically lists this copy as a book from Wittenberg. So that tells me he thought it was a Wittenberg book. Now, after he died in 1906, his collection was later auctioned off in 1930. And the auctioneers published an auction catalog for people to consult if they're interested in buying these books. This auction catalog also lists this book as a book from Wittenberg. So although it was published in 1520, buyers at the time and I thought the book was from Wittenberg, but hundreds of years later, even in 1930, people are still thinking this book is from Wittenberg. Um, so I'm really interested in this provenance history, but by the time it ended up in the Kessler collection, which it was in 1985, the bookseller they had bought it from had already identified it as a book not really from Wittenberg. It's, it's actually um, from Augsburg. And and so I, I assume by now most of these counterfeits have been, we have more collaborative research. We understand these things. They've been kind of discovered and documented. Is that right? For the most part, yes. However, it really depends, especially in the early 20th century, you're starting to see it depends on what source material or resources, reference material that librarians or catalogers or private owners have access to. Um, in the second half of the 20th century, there's Joseph Benzing published a famous bibliography of Luther's works. And in this bibliography, many of them are identified today on the German National Catalog. It will often say, um, Wittenberg, but it might have that it, this is inferred to be a publication from Strasbourg by this printer. Um, but even though that's still there, I still regularly see library catalogs where they list the copy as Wittenberg. Mm -hmm. And that will just depend on when they're cataloging the book, do they have a reason to distrust the book in front of them? Yeah. But that, I mean, this is a great example of how your work can help us, right? Because it can help us update our catalog if we're misidentifying any of these things or not representing what the, the scholarship suggests. But so, I, can, I can say the Kessler yeah. collections are all updated. So thank you. Fine. <laughs> we feel good. Um, all right. Well, let's turn from, from counterfeits to vowels back, right? Kind of going the other direction. So Edmund, I, I mean, vowels is such an interesting thing that we don't really think about in our modern context. And, and I get a sense of, you know, marriage vows, like you mentioned a few, but what kind of vows were people making in this period? And why would they have been controversial to some of the reformers? Why would they have been against vows? Yes, actually, uh, picking up what Drew says, a lot of this is about what is true and what is false. What's a true vow, what's a false vow? So not counterfeits, but uh, what, what, what's actually correct. Um, I think it's very important, as you say, you know, we can't quite picture it now, but just how much late medieval and early modern society was glued together by various forms of promissory language. Mm -hmm. And there's no hard and fast definition of the different types of promises that were there. But broadly speaking, on the one hand, you had the oath. This was a promise that you would make to another person with God acting as a witness. And then you had, on the other hand, the vow. And this was a promise that you made directly to God or one of his saints. And so a vow signified a resolution to act in a certain way. And it obliged you to do something to, to carry out what you were, the proposed action. So breaking them had actually quite serious consequences, both in your relationship to God and his saints, but also to other people as well. And as you say, there are lots of different sorts of vows. Um, and one of the ideas of my project is to try and understand them more as a phenomenon in their own right than look at them individually. But broadly, you have vows touched all members of society at very liminal points in their lives. So you have, of course, the baptismal vow, which your godparent would swear on your behalf at birth. You would have monastic and clerical vows, so the vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience that you would swear. Um, 
upon entering the convent, it's actually often a, or monastery, it's actually a multi-stage process and the final vow would come at the end. Uh, you have the pilgrimage vows, which all people throughout late medieval Europe would have been swearing. So that was a, when you were in Ill, facing illness or a moment of distress, you would swear a vow to a saint to go on pilgrimage and give thanks in return. Um, the Reformation, when it comes along, it doesn't unleash an outright rejection of all vows. As I touched on earlier, it tries to distinguish between true and false vows, between godly and ungodly ones. So we've already seen Karlstadt's uh, treatise on regarding vows or Luther in his tract on uh, monastic vows. They argue that a baptismal vow is considered a happy vow because this is a vow that comes directly from God. But something like the monastic vow or the pilgrimage vow is an ungodly one, it's a false vow because it's a form of works righteousness. It's something that goes against Christian liberty and it's in conflict with justification by faith alone. Um, at the furthest end of the extreme then, and to muddy the picture even further, you then have more groups such as Anabaptists who reject all forms of swearing altogether. So things like monastic vows, but also oath-taking. But for someone like Luther, he argues that that's nothing more than, will lead to nothing more than the breakdown of civil society. So what I'm, I suppose, trying to show in my project is you have this really dynamic situation where you have a situation where some promises, forms of promissory language are accepted by some groups, others rejected by others. And in the middle of all this, you have the actions of men and women of early modern Germany. So whether that's a monk or nun choosing to leave their monastery or convent and marry, or an Anabaptist parent choosing not to baptize their child or not to swear an oath, or even someone facing illness, what do you do in that situation? Do you go on a pilgrimage or do you not? So I'm trying to understand that dynamic and just to give you a sense of how much, you know, the debate pervaded society, here's a, uh, the Kessler copy of uh, the famous Nuremberg Meistersinger Hans Sachs's, uh, a dialogue on the hypocrisy of the religious and their vows. And in this dialogue, a Franciscan friar comes along to beg for candles from Hans the Cobbler and Peter the Baker. But whilst there getting his candles, he gets an unexpected grilling on the validity of his vows. And I think this is quite a nice example of how the way this debate actually permeates into the wider, pop wider popular culture. Yeah, it's really interesting. I mean, I guess vows are a good example of what are kind of highbrow theological ideas actually intersecting with people's actual lives, right? You have to make a decision about a vow. Exactly, and it's trying to work out the dynamic between the two, what, what's actually driving the debate. And my instinct from you know, just beginning this is it's very much driven by the decisions and then people, the reformers are having to react to it quite, and then put out a statement and then act in their own lives. I mean, most famously with, of course, people like Karstadt and Luther going on to marry. Yeah, yeah, fascinating stuff. So Alyssa, I want to turn back to something you talked about earlier, and you've worked on a critical edition of Karlstadt's work, a project that was coordinated uh, by Thomas Kaufmann out of the University of Göttingen in Germany. Um, and our colleague Ulrich Bubenheimer, who I mentioned earlier, has also been a part of that. I'm interested in projects like that, that is collaborative projects that involve the contributions of a lot of scholars from around the world. I mean, I, I think many of us think about the scholar's life as you guys sitting in your libraries all alone, surrounded by your books. Um, but that's not really the mode of scholarship these days. So do you see more collaboration like this in scholarship? How are these kinds of projects uh, done? Um, I, I can speak a, a bit to my experience with the Karlstadt edition. Um, so, you know, it's it's a very big project. Um, so it requires it requires more people because it's a very big task. Um, the, the idea is to bring together all of the letters and writings of Karlstadt into a critical edition, um, you know, and make it accessible and a bit more approachable for, you know, hopefully a long time to come. Um, and it is such a large task and requires a lot of um, involvement because Karlstadt was the second most published author of German texts after Luther at the time. Um, so, you know, there's a lot to do. Um, there is a great team of editors working there in Göttingen with Kaufmann. Um, and the edition is, it's a hybrid edition. So it's both um, in print and online. And there are definitely 
some real practical challenges to doing that well. Um, yeah, as of right now, they are, have finished um, and it's available online, all of the works up to 1520, all of Karlstadt's letters and writings uh, up until that date. Um, and then I think the print volume's coming out uh, in November very soon, kind of a 500th anniversary of 1520. Um, anyways, I, 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 I will say I learned very quickly how much work is involved in a critical edition project of this size. Um, I mentioned the real practical challenges of a hybrid edition and, and doing that well. You know, I was able to experience the challenges of making editing decisions as they arise um, alongside the, the real excitement of finding a new source or finding Carl Schatt's copy of something uh, or you know, his handwriting and uh, relevant text and trying to decide, does that need to be included? You know, these kinds of decisions. Um, I really learned a lot from that experience in my time there. Um, so, so absolutely, yes, uh, I am a fan of collaboration, you know, international collaboration. There's a lot, you know, uh, Reformation studies in the U.S. are often asking some different questions than um, our German colleagues, and uh, there's a whole world of German scholarship, and I think projects are made stronger by bringing uh, people with their different research questions and focuses and specializations together, right? You know, no, no one person knows every aspect of any subject. Um, and so I think collaboration is actually a very exciting way forward for the humanities in general. I agree with you. And I, I think that's important work you guys are doing. We're all going to run out and buy the print editions of Crawford's <laughs> work now, of course, in November. Yeah, um, English language website, actually. Forrestat-edition.org. Uh, if you're interested in seeing some English resources that have been put together about the edition. Oh, very nice. And Edmund, you've also worked on a much, maybe a smaller piece of uh, writing, but on a also collaborative project at Oxford. You, you're working on the collaborative translation and edition of the Passionale Christi, which is a work we also have a copy of. Can you give us a sense about that? And I'm particularly interested in, like Alyssa said, that's also an online project. So what does that project look like? Yeah, absolutely. So um, the Taylorian Modern Languages Library in Oxford has a collection of about 400 Reformation pamphlets. So much smaller in size than the Kessler collection, about a tenth of the size, but um, still quite a significant collection in its own right. And uh, the library has been spearheading a project to try and uh, use the pamphlets as an opportunity for graduate, postgraduate students to get training in digital humanities and creating digital editions of these pamphlets. So we have a dedicated website where students can publish the editions. And tomorrow, actually, a uh, the 500th anniversary of the publication of Luther's on um, Christian freedom, freedom of a Christian. And uh, there's going to be an event to mark um, the launch of that a new edition and translation of that. Um, I've been working, and this will appear in May next year to mark the 500th anniversary of its publication on the Passionale of Christ and Antichrist. I've actually been working on this with the other Kessler fellow, Ulrich Bubenheimer, who you've already mentioned already, and it's through him that I first learned about the, the Kessler collection and this fellowship scheme. Um, the Passionale is an extraordinary work, probably the most successful piece of visual, Reformation visual propaganda. So you have a sequence of 13 sets of images where on the left side, you always have an image from the life of Christ on the right, an image of the life of the Antichrist, i.e. the Pope. And in this example here, we see, for example, Christ washing his disciples' feet. On the right, you see the Pope having his feet kissed. So quite an obvious contrast in this respect. Um, and uh, what I'm trying to do in my uh, new edition is uh, uh, in translation. I feel the underneath each set of image you have a text, uh, a series of texts. So on the left, normally passages from the Bible. On the right, extracts from canon law. And I've often think the images in the text have sometimes become separated. And in the Weimar edition of Luther's works, quite literally, they are separated. And so I'm hoping in my edition, can we bring them back together and for English-speaking audiences to understand the power of the text and just one moment, um, I was fortunate to take place, uh, take part in an event uh, called the Library Late, where the libraries in Oxford were open late and researchers could present their research. And 
I was presenting what I'd been looking at in the past in our, and a children's cartoonist came along and was able to see uh, this uh, very early, you know, very striking piece of visual propaganda. And that, that I think was a really telling moment of why, why we should be trying to uh, make these sort of texts and images and pamphlets as accessible as possible. Yeah, one of my colleagues often refers to this as the first comic book of the Reformation. So exactly. it definitely has that. I mean, it also gives you a sense of, you know, in a culture like that where you might not have had a full literate population, this gets across your message pretty um, effectively. And like you mentioned, Drew, earlier, Luther's relationship with some of these artists is, is really significant. And these works by Lucas Cronach, whom you mentioned earlier. So um, fascinating stuff. So when you said in May, we will look for your digital edition to come out. Is That's that right? right. Yeah. Yeah, all being well. So. You get the theme. We're celebrating the 500th anniversary of lots of things, right? Because yes, yeah. <laughs> happening in the 15th and 20th. With all the dangers that involves, but also opportunities. So, Drew, we've mentioned this term. You mentioned it, and Edmund mentioned it. Digital humanities, and I know a lot of your work relates to computers. So, what can computers do with old text? How does that work? Well, they can do a lot of things, and I can't wait to see what they can do 10, 20 years from now. I think it'll be really amazing. I mean, you can teach a whole course over what is the digital humanities, and people love debating it. But I think at its most basic, it's just applying modern computational technology to the discipline of history. Um, in many cases, English scholars have done textual analyses of Shakespeare's works. Um, you could do the same thing with the corpus of Luther's works, maybe looking for specific themes and how they were present or developed over time in his writings. Um, my PhD dissertation focused on the local print industry in Wittenberg, and it was a, an analysis of volumes of production and how Luther really transformed the, transformed the industry. And oh, I, I would add that will be published next year as well, the industry of evangelism. Um, us a to buy, so. Yeah, but part of that also focuses on the title page borders done by Lucas Cronach. And you mentioned the relationship. Cronach was actually Luther's best man at his wedding. And so that's just a perfect example of, of the relationships they had. But I used, during my PhD, I was part of a project called the Universal Short Title Catalog, which is an online collective database of printing from the early modern world, looking at printing across the Low Countries and the Holy Roman Empire, France, all over Europe. For example, I could look at how many books were published by Luther in Augsburg in the 1520s in Latin, because, you know, he most he published mostly in German. So you can you can look at specific filters like that. Um, the current project I'm working on is focusing on images. So Edmund mentions the illustrations in the previous work, I'll pull up the slide again. Here, I would be interested for my own research to know where these, he talks about the woodcuts being separated from the text. I would like to know how far they were separated and that were these woodcuts ever used by themselves in other publications? Because woodcuts, woodcuts were not cheap for a printer. It, it required them to pay extra, hire an artist, somebody to cut it, and they would, they would space it out and use it in multiple editions, which brings the price per copy down to a more affordable level. So I'm really interested in how images were used. For example, you could look at, as this becomes a huge era for Bible publishing, what were the most popular Bible stories to be illustrated? Was that different in different geographical areas or at different times? We know Luther was involved in choosing which illustrations he wanted in his own translation. So I, I presume that the computer helps you do work more efficiently and work in a broader set of literature and do stuff that just a single researcher couldn't read or look at all these things, him or herself. Exactly. I'm, I'm quite lucky to be here in Dublin because with my colleague, Alexander Wilkinson, here in the School of History, we have access um, to a supercomputer run by the Irish Center for High End Computing. Um, we have time and space on that because otherwise, I mean, I did the math. If I just wanted to rename every image file and I, it took me five seconds per image, it would take me over 300 days to do that. And um, so the scale is just sometimes it's sometimes it's um, makes you a bit scared. Like, what am I doing? Um, 
but I think it's well worth the effort. That's fascinating. We all want to come use the supercomputer. So give us some <laughs> yeah. that. So from going to modern technology, going backwards, Evan, I, I failed to mention earlier, what's really cool is you have a family connection to this. You, you come by this honestly. Can you tell us about your grandfather and how you got into this kind of work? Yeah, so uh, yeah, as you say, take a step back in time. Um, but no, my grandfather, he wrote his doctorate back in the uh, early 1950s on uh, the first German translation in the 14th century of a uh, psalm commentary by Nicholas de Vera. And he did an edition of this uh, early New High German text. And then he went on to a career in academic libraries and was a great collector of German books as well. And uh, he was absolutely- Any counterfeits? Brilliant. Sorry? Any counterfeits? Any counterfeits, I, don't, I, I, I suspect so, but yeah, no, no. he didn't have the computers back then, so harder to, to, to be able to tell. Um, but no, he was, um, he, he always, you know, he engaged quite a bit with Luther actually, um, and uh, worked on Luther quite considerably. So it's, um, he was really thrilled when I heard about this and is really excited by, the, by, by my opportunity, so yeah. That's great. So we've talked a lot about changing scholarship and how things are, are different. And you, you guys are all at the kind of early part of what I assume are gonna be incredibly promising and, and uh, prolific careers. Um, but I think we all recognize the academic world landscape is changing, right? The ways that we teach, the ways that we do scholarship are different. So just each of you, we'll just start with you. Alyssa, can you give us a sense of how you see the field of scholarship changing? How is research changing in light of technology and you know international culture and that kind of thing? Well, the field was changing a lot uh, before COVID-19 uh, and this pandemic. So you know, in some ways it's changing even more now, I think. I think we're all wondering what things are going to look like moving forward. Um, I'm thinking especially of the American university system uh, where the humanities were already, you know, shall we say, struggling a bit. Um, uh, one of the differences I see is uh, in most areas of life right now, uh, I suspect that digital access demands are going to continue to grow. You know, the demand for this kind of work is going to keep growing. Um, you know, one thing, libraries have always been the historian's friend. You know, I often tell new students, get to know your librarians. You'll know what you have access to and what you can work with. Um, and I think that conviction has just become more uh, solidified with everything going on right now. Um, so for example, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking about my colleagues who are having to change their dissertation proposals here because of access problems right now. You know, it's hard to not, you know, not only is it hard to visit archives internationally, but it's hard to leave your state right now. So I think, you know, I think that libraries have in particular, a really good, um, you know, I think they're crucial as kind of the keepers of knowledge. Uh, they play this crucial role in research. And I think making library materials accessible, making these kinds of additions di digitally, you know, there's a reason this has kind of been a push in the EU, especially. Um, and I, I think that our current situation will just continue to kind of push in this direction. That's kind of my take on the, the uh, landscape. Yeah, I, I think you're right. I mean, I think the pandemic only accelerates things that were already moving, right? Drew or Edmund, do you guys have thoughts about what the future may hold for us as researchers? Well, I mean, just on the pandemic, like I often think if this had happened five years earlier, I don't know if universities would have been prepared to shift everything online so quickly if the infrastructure was in place. Um, but as for digital opportunities with libraries, providing scans of books online, I'm really excited for this, obviously, because my work relies upon digital editions. And I'm really excited to see how digital objects can be used and analyzed in ways the physical object cannot be. Um, so uh, although these digital scans provide access to books for people who can't show up in person in the library, I think they, they provide so many more opportunities than just as a digital surrogate. Um, so I'm really excited to see where that goes. I think the next big jump will be when OCR text recognition software is able to read the Gothic typefaces of old German books and when these 
large text corpa can be created, um, I think that'll be fascinating. Yeah, we've been working really hard to try to get the computers to recognize the Fractor script and it, yeah. it's not well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I want to, I mean, the core question that we're trying to get at with this collection is why does this stuff matter, right? These are old books and they're neat and they're pretty and they're valuable. But each of you also teaches. And so I'm curious what you tell your students. Why should they learn about this stuff? So Evan, we'll just start with you. When you interact with students at Oxford, why does it matter? Why should someone care about what happened in 1520? Well, first, I'd say there are cha challenges to it and that have become particularly pronounced now. I think there are the challenge of um, it's at school, high school level, in the UK certainly, and I, I believe in the US as well, the, the just a the real crisis in German language learning and Latin language learning and what that means for the future of the discipline. Um, I think, you know, you, we can go to the Kester collection and show a pamphlet and the students can admire it. You know, this old book is, you know, it's generally very exciting, but then, you know, how can we train the next, another generation of historians, especially non-German historians to come along and have those, you know, the language and technical, technical skills required to, to engage with them. So I think, you know, this crisis in language learning you know, has a real knock-on effect for auxiliary subjects such as history and theology. So there are challenges and perhaps also in particularly in the UK context also the lack of religious education mm -hmm. in schools or not coming from a religious background. What, what does this mean for you and how, how do you engage with it and understand it? Uh, but my own work on, you know, on vows, it's interesting if you just Google New York Times April 2020, Donald Trump vows more coronavirus testing. In the same month on the BBC, Boris Johnson vows more virus tests. So the language of vowing hasn't gone away, but I would say it's lost a lot of its power. And suddenly it's lost, you know, it's association with the religious and the divine. But I think as well, it's just become vow has become used by newspaper headline writers synonymously with promise. And the early modern period that couldn't be further from the truth. Um, so I think it's interesting to think about a moment in history that I would probably think where sort of the language of promises begins to be disrupted in quite a significant way and the implications of that. And then the wider issues involved in vowing. This is about your relationship as a young child to your parent. At what age do you reach maturity and have responsibility? It's about issues of consent and trust how you interact with other members of society, with your own family, with others, with authority. Um, so in that respect, I think there's a lot actually we can learn from looking at this issue in the 16th century. And again, going back to what I've said earlier, and I keep emphasizing that this isn't just an obscure theological debate, but it's important that we understand it now. Well, yeah, I think you make that point very, very well. Alyssa, why, why should we care about the like disputations or why should we care about Karlstadt's works? Uh, I, and I feel very strongly about this question. Um, and I also think, um, you know, perhaps it's been a bit easier for me because I've been in a Protestant seminary context before and, and teaching in the context for my PhD. So maybe some of these uh, connections have been even more upfront in my context. But you know, I often talk to students about you know, the Reformation is a time of so much rapid change and rethinking of things that were taken for granted for a long period of time. You know, social, political, religious, it's kind of all being questioned and, um, you know, real gifts are happening that still affect the world today. So not only is it important to kind of know why some of the things that we do are connected to some of these events, um, but I think it also helps us know how to perhaps respond or look at our own time where things are obviously also very drastically changing. And, um, you know, even what we've been talking about, print, digital, uh, you know, some of these things are some of the things that Drew's looking at, for example, in the 16th century itself. So, and then Karlstadt specifically, I mean, some of the issues that the Reformation raises are some of the things that I'm most personally interested in. So, for example, questions about what do we consider authoritative for knowledge or, you know, or how do we read those things by hermeneutical questions? You know, Christians uh, everywhere 
uh, in any kind of congregation, a lot of what we do in our churches revolves around those questions. You know, how we read the Bible, for example. You know, that impacts that impacts in some ways almost everything that we do. Um, and I think Crawford is an example of someone who was truly transformed by the text that he read. You know, he was reading the Bible of Augustine and changing through his reading of it. Uh, that's what I try to show anyway. And I, I think, you know, then he goes in and impacts, it impacts his life and he goes on and this makes real changes in the world around him as well. You know, there's a lot that we can, we can learn from that. So I'll stop now before I... No, your, your, your passion comes through and it's a yeah. wonderful thing, yeah. Drew, I'm going to turn to you. I, I, assume, I assume it has something to do with a, a rapid period of technological innovation that mirrors <sighs> its own, but uh, I don't want to answer for you. So why do we care about the German print industry of the 16th century? Right. Well, people often talk about whether or not Luther's movement would have been successful without the printing press. Um, and we talk about the printing press as this big... Um, time of revolution and spread of knowledge, but really it it wasn't new. A L Luther never lived in a world without the printing press. You know, his parents for most of their lives never lived in a world without the printing press. Um, yet the Protestant Reformation is really Europe's first mass media event. Um, this is the first time that print is being used by both sides for directed propaganda campaigns, um, the amount of publishing skyrocketed. And, you know, in, in terms of my counterfeits, Luther loved printing and he loved seeing his works print reprinted in other cities, even without his permission, because it helped spread his evangelical ideas. Yet, with these counterfeits, or maybe printers just did a bad job at reprinting, he often complained about the poor quality of these reprints. In, in one instance, he says there's so many errors but I can't even claim to be the author of that work anymore. You know, and it's it's similar today how like with social media, many people rely on it to spread their message. Yet there's also lots of debate about people complaining about the negative aspects of how um, particular news items go viral. Um, so it is still applicable. And then also I'm quite interested in the development of the history of graphic design and using design to share information. I mean, a, a designer made the decision to design the video software we're using right now on maybe our four windows, or if we're gonna show slides, they decided this was the best way to convey information. And people were making these same decisions in the 1520s, and it was a, it was a new industry for them. Well, thank you all. I'm, I'm conscious of our time and we're running up against the limit of it. So I want to, we could go on forever, of course, but I want to thank Alyssa, Drew, and Edmund, uh, not only for their time and conversation today, but for the research they're doing and will continue to do with the Kessler Collection. It's important, as you can see, and it's really exciting to see our collection being explored by three really, really smart and interesting people. I also want to remind you all of the rest of our Kessler Collection um, events that are going on uh, this fall. We have our final conversation with Professor Ronald Ritgers coming up this week, uh, November 4th. But all of these events are available online and I encourage you to share them with your friends and um, learn about the collection and learn about the interesting work that's going on with the collection. Thank you for your time today. I'm glad you were able to join us and uh, Drew, Evan, Alyssa, good luck with your work and thanks for being with us. Thank you. Thank you.